Right. <clears throat> Hi, Mindy. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you all for your patience as we as we get set up with the technology here. If you are able to in the group chat, just uh, give a introduction and and note where you're from uh, here in in the city. And if you're representing an organization, you can go ahead and add that. Um, and then we'll just ask for folks to go ahead and mute themselves because there are a lot of us and uh, background conversations, so adorable, uh, can be distracting. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, I am Commissioner Fatham. I represent District 1, which is the uh, many of the Northern Ramsey County suburbs. So all are part of uh, Spring Lake Park and Blaine, the portions that are in Ramsey County, Arden Hills, Shoreview, North Oaks, Gem Lake, Badness Heights, uh, White Bear Township. I forget one. Jump in and correct me, Sheena, if I forgot any of them. <laughs> I raced through them quickly. Um, we also have uh, Commissioners Victoria Reinhardt, Mary Jo McGuire, and uh, Commissioner Tristan Mattis Casillo, who represent uh, all of the other Ramsey County suburbs. Uh, here with us today. Um, we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, this was something that as I've been working with our um, economic development team, uh, something that I thought was really important as I spent a lot of time talking with folks over the last year about affordable housing. What does that mean? There were so many misconceptions uh, about it. And as someone, um, this is something that's really personal to me because uh, housing affordability is really my family's story and my story growing up in the Ramsey County suburbs, uh, moving from my parents' divorce when I was very young, uh, getting out of some unsafe living conditions in the city and moving to uh, cramped but safe conditions in the Ramsey County suburbs was how my family got their start and what I really thought was a big factor in my, my success and the success of my siblings. So whether it was the six members uh, with my dad and my stepmom and my uh, two brothers and sisters, uh, a sister living in a two bedroom apartment in White Bear Lake, uh, or all of us in a small bungalow, uh, six of us in a three bedroom bungalow in New Brighton, uh, being able to access the safe communities and parks in the Ramsey County suburbs and the excellent schools in the Mounds View School District for me and the White Bear Lake schools for my brothers uh, made a huge difference in the successful outcomes for my family. And so affordable housing and making sure families can access that safe, stable housing is, um, is what I view as the, the center piece of my family's success and something that I really want for every family. So that's why talking about uh, affordable, housing in the suburbs is is a really critical thing for me and someone uh, who has focused my career on the success for young children. So I want to thank um, our, our Ramsey County staff and Center for Economic Inclusion and uh, MV Solutions. Did I get that right, Maria? <laughs> but I'm looking at you. It's close. I got it close. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the notes, but uh, we are super excited to have everyone here today. Um, I'm gonna let them launch into our presentation, um, and I think throughout uh, we'll have opportunities for the other commissioners to jump in and speak, and we will have an opportunity for you all to ask your questions. So the chat feature is here. We're going to be monitoring it as your questions come up, uh, and then we will have a Q and A session, and we'll also have opportunities where staff and our and our other presenters will be reflecting back on you to get some community driven solutions. So thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get started.
Good evening and thank you all for joining us. I'm Tawana Black and I'm the founder and CEO of the Center for Economic Inclusion and I'm consulting on this project alongside with Ramsey County and many of our um, peer consultants. I'm thrilled that Maria Zimmerman um, is here joining me from MZ Solutions and I'm thrilled also to be partnering alongside um, many of our commissioners from Ramsey County and Martha Faust from Ramsey County. Um, and I'm really grateful that all of you have joined us this evening um, because this uh, topic is very important as we move forward on the economic competitiveness and inclusion project and the importance of affordable housing throughout Ramsey County and the entire um, metro region and the state of Minnesota is one of the most important um, facets of not only our everyday lives but our ability to ensure that our state's economy continues to grow and prosper and the importance of being able to hear from you as residents um, uh, business owners and property owners of Ramsey County is going to be particularly important to our ability to craft solutions that help this economy continue to grow and help advise Ramsey County commissioners and staff and leaders um, in designing the very best strategies uh, for this plan. So we look forward to great dialogue with you tonight. We're going to share some data with you, some analysis that we've been able to do in partnership with our um, peers at Fourth Economy and the Center um, at NAO and MZ Strategies, as well as the great team at Ramsey County tonight. We're going to share some concepts with you um, based on that data and analysis um, and what we know about the housing market throughout uh, suburban Ramsey County and hope to also spend quite a bit of time in dialogue with you about what you've seen work well, what barriers to creating um, more affordable housing, both policy solutions in both the public and private and community sectors, as well as being able to see that housing both developed and sustained throughout the county and what recommendations you might have for us as we move forward um, together in not only the design of the plan, but on implementation um, in the coming months and years and look forward to great discussion um, for this evening. I'm going to now move to be able to share um, our screen and so I'll ask our um, team, uh, Martha and team, if you can help us uh, in being able to share this. I don't have, right now it's not giving me permission to be able to share, if you can help me make that happen. I think Maria is going to load the, the slides. Let me know, Maria, if you need assistance, I can, I can do the same. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm getting a, one participant can share at a time. Okay. So, so it's not letting me pull mine up either. Okay, so I'm, I can, I would be happy to do it. Let me get this into. Awesome. Thanks so much, Martha. I'll begin just a little bit of discussion and maybe walk through what our agenda will be like tonight for you all. Thanks so much. Um, if you could go to our next slide. We're going to walk through tonight just a little bit on why we've decided to talk a little bit about affordable housing with you. We'll talk a little bit about what our housing trends look like in Ramsey County. We'll discuss some of the housing barriers um, to being able to both grow and expand affordable housing and then move into our discussion. We want to continue to remind you as you come onto the call to share um, who you are in the chat and then later we'll also encourage you to be continue sharing comments and questions. Um, and as Maria and I trade off through this, we'll also be able to answer questions that might pop up in the chat as well. Next slide, please. So as we look at this um, analysis, we want to start by considering what the need for affordable housing looks like within Ramsey County. Next slide, please. First is an analysis as we think about why we are even considering Ramsey County. When we look at this work um, for the county, Ramsey County has really been very intentional about aligning the resources that exist to be able to increase supply and improve both the services that are available and really having a particular focus on the ultimate outcomes. We know that housing is one of the foundational outcomes for assisting each resident and each person in being able to carry out our lives. And it goes beyond only having a house, but really in the way that each one of us operate but it's important for us to understand what people are experiencing throughout the entire county as it relates to accessing housing, the cost burden that people are experiencing, who is experiencing that cost burden, understanding the area median income is one of the things that we'll talk about tonight, 
and understanding the need for region-wide affordable housing and where that shows up in terms of where we have strengths and where we're facing challenges in different places throughout Ramsey County. Next slide, please. One of the things that we want to focus on as well is how we center equity and inclusion in this plan and our opportunities to do so. <clears throat> Excuse me. With this plan as it relates to economic competitiveness, we feel like it's particularly important for us to be considering ways to both grow our affordable housing and center the needs and opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. What we know within Ramsey County's data is that we see people who have less than 30% of area median income, which in this case is those who are earning 30,000 and below, continue to face significant challenges in accessing affordable housing in Ramsey County, and that those needs continue to con move forward as we see those incomes rising. And yet those who are in this category excuse me, of low, our low income residents and those who are people of color have higher needs and in, in being able to access that because of the low wages paid throughout the region and particularly within Ramsey County. As we think about that and move further through the slide, you'll see the relative nature of income related to accessing housing continues to be go hand in hand in this data. Next slide, please. Again, stressing that housing is a fundamental building block for economic competitiveness. These nine boxes that you see on the screen um, before you and those related on the right are facets of the regional economic framework adopted both by Greater MSP and its regional economic plan last year and in the regional economic framework recently adopted by the Met Council, Greater MSP, and the Center for Economic Inclusion, the organization that I lead, as an interwoven framework to enable the region to both grow its economy, strengthen our opportunities for business growth and expansion, and to be able to ensure that we're able to attract federal resources for business growth and economic competitiveness, particularly with a focus on racial inclusion. Because inclusive growth is proven as a driver for vitality and prosperity, one that ensures that not only are our communities of color growing and thriving, but that every resident of Minnesota, and in particular of the Twin Cities, is able to grow and thrive, and that our economy continues to be prosperous. It's important for us to ensure that these elements of job growth, talent migration, workforce development, brand and image, and housing affordability and transportation mobility are all interdependent, and our strategies are interdependent so that things like housing affordability and transportation mobility, considerations about where our businesses are located and where affordable housing are located are designed hand in hand, become very important in our ability to ensure that our cities and counties and our ultimate region are very competitive in the future. And our strategies must be designed that way. Next slide, please. Affordable housing today is out of reach for a significant number of low-wage Ramsey County residents. As you can see on this slide, we've begun analyzing who is actually struggling to be able to afford the housing that both exists today and housing that is being developed within the county, and then begun to an analyze which job classifications pay the types of wages that would enable those residents to be able to access these jobs. This relates to the data we just talked about and the need for, again, those strategies to relate one to another. Thinking about how we move individuals who today are not making wages that allow them to access affordable housing into jobs that would allow them to begin to reach those places requires very intentional outreach. More than that, requires intentional strategies, but requires us to also understand where those jobs are located, who's paying those jobs, and whether or not employers are conscious of strategies that would enable them to target those employees who today are not able to access and afford affordable housing. And it requires us to ensure that our business attraction and retention strategies are connected to our efforts for locating affordable housing. I'll give you a moment to be able to see that slide. Next slide, please. We also want to be sure that we're thinking about who is impacted in our communities. Often when we use the words affordable housing, low income housing, naturally affordable 
occur, naturally occurring affordable housing, we have images of people who look different than us. But do we understand who is impacted? When we use words like area median income or just 30% of AMI, who do you envision? We wanna be sure that tonight as we go through our conversations and begin, begin imagining a different future here in suburban Ramsey County, that we're actually very conscious of who is being impacted today as we create new options and who might be impacted tomorrow as we reimagine opportunities for increasing affordable housing in your communities. Do you know who is serving in jobs like those that you see on the screen? Who can afford to live in affordable housing? What is affordable housing? What does it look like? Is it located on your block? Is it located in your neighborhood? When is the last time that you lived in housing that might qualify in any of these categories? Do you know people who work in these jobs? Do you know if the people in these jobs in your business, in your organization, can afford affordable housing? The sooner that we're able to make these types of discussions tangible, not just in our organizations, but tangible for us personally, the sooner we're able to take meaningful actions every day to ensure that everyone in our cities, everyone in our county has not just access to affordable housing, but actually has affordable housing that they can balance and maintain on a month to month basis and a year to year basis. Here we see that home health aides are earning about $25,000 a year and supporting a family four of four is about $621. The rent for that is $621. We think about being able to make that work with all of the other expenses in our market, and then think about the economic shocks that come into a market at a time like this, when we've had two pandemics impacting significant numbers of people, we have to be able to consider how to increase that affordable housing and what steps different people have to take, policymakers, business leaders, employers, neighbors, in order to ensure that everyone in our community can access that affordable housing. And the list goes on as we look at different ends of this spectrum. Next slide, please. We think it's important as we go about this work to also be considering the impacts of racial inclusion, recognizing that affordable housing has been something that's been far too out of reach for different portions of our communities. And in particular, as it relates to our black communities, the exclusion that has been done by historic policies in our, in our region, in our state, and ultimately in our country, legally, unfortunately, still has repercussions here in Minnesota due to the historic redlining in our communities. This term, if it's one that you're not familiar with, refers to the historical practices done by banks, real estate companies, and the US government to deny mortgages to black, indigenous, and other peoples by banks and other institutions to ensure that some housing was restricted only to white families. While this was ruled illegal in 1968, we know by data, data available on our website at the Center for Economic Inclusion, that this practice unfortunately continues here in Minnesota today to the detriment of families that are still earning up to $100,000 in our communities. To undo this work requires not only the removal of racial covenants, but also anti-racist practices by banks, by employers, and ultimately significant advocacy by policymakers, residents, and neighbors. Next slide, please. The Mapping Prejudice Project has done work to ensure that each one of us fully understand the repercussions of this prejudice, this racism and discrimination in our communities. And while much of this work has been done significantly in Minneapolis and more of it is beginning and continuing in Ramsey County, we felt like it was important for you to see the impacts of these laws and work in this state. I'll give you a moment to be able to see this work mapped here. This time lapse from the Mapping Prejudice Project illustrates where and when housing covenants were applied throughout Hennepin County. While redlining did not occur in suburban Ramsey County in the same way that it did in St. Paul and Minneapolis, it is with certainty that we know that first and second ring suburbs in Ramsey County contain hotspots for racial housing covenants. 
Mapping Prejudice is currently transcribing deeds across Ramsey County in order to map the impact of this. Thank you, Martha. At this time, I will transition to Maria for our housing analysis. I'm sorry, no, I won't, I'll keep going. Got a couple more slides. We want to talk a little bit about the state of affordable housing. Or do I? Am I transitioning? I think I am transitioning, right, Maria? I think you were going to go for a few more, but okay. if you need to, I can. No, I am. It's, okay. This is what happens when you've got two machines going. Thank you. I can go to the next slide, please. We want to talk a little bit about the state of affordable housing in our region. We've been analyzing, excuse me, reports to be able to get a, a clear understanding of where things stand within our region, and in particular, where things stand in relation to the Minneapolis-St. Paul region and how that relates to what's happening here within Ramsey County. We find, as you can see on the screen, that we have significant need for additional affordable housing and particularly for additional affordable rental housing. We know that rents are rising and less affordable for Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, that our vacancy rates are declining, and we're not keeping up with the demand and the need within the region. This data comes from many of the organizations that you see on the left of your screen who are doing significant work throughout the region, both to not only produce this data, but also to increase the access and availability for affordable housing throughout the region. There's a need for additional types of housing as located on the side of your screen. And we want to note for you today that this data has only become, this not only the data, but the need for this types of housing has only become more complex and more significant as a result of the higher increased need um, from COVID-19 as significant populations have been uh, become unemployed as a result of the pandemics. Next slide, please. We also think it's important to note that affordable housing production is also not keeping pace with the needs and the trends throughout our region. We have a housing assessment that has been done pre-COVID that lets us know on the next slide that the rents in many communities are unaffordable and rising at 8%. Our biggest need for these rental units, as you see on the screen here, is for those cost burden rental renters who are at working age. Workers cannot afford to live in our region. While again, we mentioned earlier asking you to picture in your minds who needs affordable housing. Unfortunately, again, in these conversations, often we picture people who just aren't working hard enough, who if they just put forth a little more effort or were just a little more committed, could find themselves great housing. But the data tells us that's not the story. 93% of cost burden renters earn less than $50,000 a year, but are working, are putting forth that effort and still can't access the housing that is required. And above 50% of area median income, there are more cost burdened homeowners who are still putting out those resources, but are not putting, getting back the return that is needed and cannot afford to live in the way that we would choose for them to. Ramsey County has typically and historically been slower to respond to the recession, and we have concerns about whether or not that will hold true as we move through and out of the COVID-19 pandemics. Next slide, please. As we look at and consider ways to be able to center equity and inclusion, <clears throat> excuse me, in this area, and continue to reinforce this, it's going to need, be important for us to continue to be flexible with our approach and particularly need for us to center these populations who have historically been excluded. To think about not only how we ensure that we have affordable housing available, but how we also are intentional about ensuring that families are able to move forward in ways that allow them to build wealth. That we consider the impacts of dual pandemics on communities of color that we consider the fabric of communities as they work to access affordable housing, and that we consider the needs of communities of color in particular, and the intersectionality between workforce development, business development, communities, and the incomes that communities are facing and their ability to be able to access that affordable housing and the programs and supports that may be needed in order to center, but also in order to maintain that competitive economy that we're trying to build. Next slide, please. 
One of the things that's important for us as we assess this data is to be able to understand that the vast majority of our minority cost burdened households are earning less than 50% of our area meeting it median income. And yet that the vast majority of our minority renters are more likely to be cost burdened than our white households. This data can't, point can't be reinforced enough. Given that, in contrast to that, we do see a significant number of white households who are cost burdened. Next slide, please. The area median income now that you're able to examine by, white, by um, households gives us an opportunity to be able to understand this. Most of the renters here who are facing this cost burden are le earning less than 50% of our area median income. Less than 50% of our area median income. These are our lowest wage earners who are putting forth the vast majority of their income in order to sustain affordable housing, to secure that housing and maintain it. And yet we know that we have a growing problem and challenge with workers being able to sustain and attract that housing um, to begin with. We have this challenge facing us significantly. Forgive me for the um, barrier. I recognize we've got chat um, questions coming in. I wanna be sure that this isn't a place where we might not wanna be able to have the conversation. So flag me team if we should pause to be able to have that. Next slide, please. We want to be able to examine this notion of our cost burden households by race and ethnicity as well. So while we examined it just a moment ago by our area median income, we also want to be able to examine this by race and ethnicity and understand that we also see our minority households who are cost burdened are also overwhelmingly earning less than 50% AMI. The majority of those households, again, um, who are cost burdened are white. However, because we see such stark differences in our earnings of our communities of color, the cost burden share of those households who are also struggling to be able to access affordable housing and are carrying that cost burden is more significant for our communities of color. Next slide, please. Our income disparities, as you would then anticipate, drive unequal housing opportunity and a greater struggle to be able to access affordable housing throughout our region. Next slide, please. At this time, I will actually transition over to my colleague, Maria Zimmerman. Great, thank you, Tawana. Um, so I will quickly talk through um, some of the slides where we we moved from the regional analysis and the Ramsey County kind of countywide uh, discussion that we've just heard around what is that need for housing that really is affordable for those households that are earning below fifty thousand dollars and what who are those households what does it look like to looking a little bit more specifically at how that breaks out across different um, suburban jurisdictions within the county so Martha we can move to the next slide uh, and and again to mention um, our team that has been working to pull together this analysis has been looking both at census data at information um, that the Metropolitan Council has pulled together, that the Minnesota Housing Partnership, uh, Cura, and lots of other folks that have been um, doing quite a bit of work, as you may be well aware of, across the state of Minnesota to really look at the growing statewide housing needs for affordable housing uh, have identified. And so we've been pulling from that. And, and obviously there was a huge shock to the system that has happened here in 2020 as COVID uh, has, has really impact um, economic opportunity and also what's happening in the housing market. And I think it will be quite a while before we have the full scope of what um, these, these shifts might mean. And so we're really trying to get our hands around some different scenarios of what those might look like. But we know that before uh, February of 2020, uh, across the county, uh, we saw over the last few years that rents have been steadily increasing. Uh, in the last year, in 2019, we saw that they were on average increasing by 8 to 10% uh, for those who were renting. 
Home values uh, had not been historically increasing at quite that same rate, but last year, again, we saw a real uptick uh, at, across the county of those home values increasing by about 8%. Uh, again, we know with COVID from some of the real-time tracking that the Federal Reserve and the Met Council have been doing um, that unemployment, uh, to just kind of put this in perspective, uh, unemployment um, within uh, the, the region has increased to 9%, where last year it was about 3% as, as a result of the COVID impacts. Uh, we have seen uh, housing home purchases have actually been holding steady, um, but the question around rents really continue to remain. So we'll, we're trying to kind of take this all into consideration in real time. And again, in the chat box would welcome if you've been personally affected um, over the last few months by challenges paying your rent or paying your mortgage or, or any of that, or you, maybe you've sold a house or you know who someone who has and you can tell us a little bit of information, we'd love to capture those stories in the chat. So we'll go to the next slide, please, Martha. Um, so as we look across the county and we look at juris different jurisdictions, uh, we can see that while it's about an average 8% um, increase across the county, in some communities, uh, we've seen that the increase has been below 7.5%. Uh, Roseville, White Bear, uh, Arden Hills, North St. Paul, and Moundsview. Whereas in others, we've seen uh, home values increase over 10%. Um, I think what's interesting as well in thinking about this is both uh, the qual you know, size of homes, quality of homes, age of homes, all of this plays into consideration. We also know from some national research out of the Brookings Institution um, that uh, homes, the same home um, in a community that's majority community of color, uh, often are undervalued compared to that same home in another community uh, that is majority white community. And so sort of trying to unpack some of these things. When we look at rental costs, we kind of see a similar uh, variation across the county. Uh, some of those same counties with more affordable Home prices also have more affordable rents, and conversely, those uh, with higher uh, home value increases also seeing higher rents. Uh, next slide, please, Martha. Um, so as we, we kind of touched upon earlier, we're really seeing the biggest need in, in what's been happening as wages have not been increasing at the same rate that rents have been increasing, uh, that there's a, a growing need, a growing gap for housing for those households that are earning less than $30,000 per year. Uh, and again, trying to um, make that monthly rent payment. Um, Within the county, this overall gap that we're seeing at that level is about 1,250 units of housing, just to kind of keep up and, and make that. So um, we'll go to the next slide, please, Martha. And so uh, again, just looking at total affordable units in the suburbs, this is excluding data from St. Paul. So we're just looking in, in the other jurisdictions within the county. And you can see um, the breakout here of affordable owner units and the affordable renter units uh, and how that varies depending on how much you're earning. So um, what we've also seen during this time period is that there has been a loss overall of about 1,500 units as the county has been um, uh, losing about 1,900 affordable units, homeowner units each year. Uh, and adding 400 affordable rental units. So it may be that some of those um, single family homes are now being rented out. It may be some of those are you know, being flipped and gentrified and the price is increasing. But again, we have this gap of about 15 housing, 1,500 units that would be affordable um, to households at 50% or below area median income. Next slide. Uh, and so this speaks to this fact that uh, our production is not keeping pace with the current need. There's a lot of reasons for this, um, and we're, we're really trying to explore those. Some of those are just the increase in costs of providing housing, regardless of, of the rate of the rent that you're charging. We know building materials have increased, we know land prices have increased, and we know there's some land availability issues as well in the county. Next slide. So uh, the Metropolitan Council, um, they look region-wide in their housing plan that's part of the Thrive MSP 2040 plan, and they um, 
project that Ramsey County suburban population will grow by um, a little under 6,000 uh, people and the affordable housing need will grow uh, by 1,800 between 2021 and 2023. And so they've allocated that demand across the different jurisdictions. And you can see here in this slide, the green is showing the projected population growth within the different jurisdictions and then the projected need for affordable housing units. And so you can see, not surprisingly, places like Maplewood, Arden Hills, White Bear Lake, New Brighton, where we're projecting uh, population growth, we're gonna see the need to have more affordable housing units there as well. Next slide. Um, and then uh, when we, we really look at this and we break it out by income levels, as we've been talking about for the last few minutes, uh, again, we also see um, that given the economic diversity of our community, of, of who lives here, the types of jobs that we have, the type of households that we have, we also need to see that diversity in our housing um, supply. And so, again, looking at that across the ju different jurisdictions, um, you can see the green is for, again, the, the low income um, households earning less than 30,000 a year for a household of four. The purple is those making under 50,000. And then the yellow is those making under 80,000 again for a household of four people. Next slide, please. Uh, we have some higher growth communities, and these are places, again, where the Met Council is projecting uh, significant employment growth and household growth in those counties. Um, because of that employment growth in particular, we, we you know, anticipate that there's going to be greater needs for housing and also for infrastructure to support that housing is to support those jobs and how we think about things like transit and other infrastructure investments. Um, these communities also will have higher housing costs that may make them less affordable. Uh, and we know St. Paul itself is projected to add uh, almost 1,300 households and uh, almost 1,900 jobs um, during this same time period. Next slide, please. And then we have some communities um, that are not projected to see those same high levels of, of growth um, necessarily in households. But when we look at this slide, we can see, wow, really some incredible economic growth that's projected for some of our communities. A White Bear Township, Balkan Heights, Moundsview. Um, and so again, there's gonna be a real need for thinking about housing opportunities in these places and also thinking about some of that infrastructure to support that employment growth. Um, many of these communities um, may have lower household costs because they don't have quite um, some of the pressure. Some of them, the reverse will be true. We also know across the county and especially in our suburban communities, some of those that we saw the more affordable rents and home values, that they have what's often called naturally occurring affordable housing um, or it's market rate affordable housing. So again, it may be, it's an older home. Um, it, it may be that it's a landlord who's charging a real affordable rent. Whatever the reason may be, there's gonna be a real need to preserve those types of housing units. Next slide. Um, and then we know that in Ramsey County, it's actually one of the most dense counties in the United States and by population density, uh, not intellectual density. Um, and we also know that there's not a lot of uh, vacant land that's really out there and, and ripe for redevelopment. And so this slide is really kind of showing um, what you see here is, uh, again, by different jurisdictions, those that um, have vacant or unknown land use potential and properties uh, and, and really thinking about how we might be able uh, to utilize that. We also see in green, a lot of our um, land uses are residential to so single family homes, residential uh, homes. Um, so how do we really get smart and strategic about thinking about where those uh, redevelopment opportunities are? Next slide. So what does it all mean? Um, putting this all together, that was a lot of data that we just quickly ran through in, in 
relatively short amount of time, but still a lot of data. Um, you know, just again, at, at what we've kind of been underscoring is that, you know, we really need to make sure that um, housing that is affordable to all, it's, it's needed in our communities, it's needed in all of our communities, and some to more degree than in others. Uh, we know that the pace of housing production is not keeping pace with demand. Uh, and I think um, that's particularly true for housing that is affordable because you know, it can cost the same amount in some ways to build a, a high-end housing unit or a lower-end housing unit, depending on what kind of amenities you put there. But the, the bricks, the mortar, the steel, the concrete, the labor, those things are really true. And if we can't uh, be charging the higher rents, then we have this gap. And so we need to think about the market's gonna say, I, I can't make up that gap, so I'm not gonna provide that type of housing. So we get this ever growing housing gap and housing need. So because um, if, if we have a growing percentage of our population, especially our population working in a lot of these essential healthcare service type industries, um, different occupations across the region, uh, if, if they can't find affordable housing in the county, they're gonna be looking elsewhere and that's gonna have an impact on our economic health and competitiveness. So um, with all of these different factors, this is really what's been motivating uh, the economic competitiveness and inclusion plan that we are working with the county on and we'll be working with over um, the rest of this year. Next slide, please, Martha. Uh, and we have some questions for you and I'll also put into the chat box, um, through the economic and inclusion plan, we've been doing a number of different ways to engage and outreach with communities. We have a survey on the website where we're asking people to share input. We have some sessions coming up next week where we're gonna be digging a lot more deeply into potential solutions. And it's an open invitation. We really would invite and encourage you to continue um, to be part of this process. So we'll put that website link in there where you can get updates, you can provide input, you can come to more meetings to talk about this and, and other issues related to job growth and entrepreneurship uh, and place-based assets and really how do we preserve and make our, our cities and county a really special place to continue to live and work. So I will pause here if there are questions or there are other comments that folks want to make or Tawana if you want to lead us through the discussion. Well, first, why don't we find out if there are questions that you all have for any of the data that we've reviewed, and then we'll get into these two discussion questions. Okay, I don't see any hands in the actual chat so far. Okay. Well, then we'll go right into the discussion question. So let's raise the first one. Our first question for you all is ways, can you tell us ways that you think Ramsey County can develop solutions for the pressing housing challenges and particularly for those who are most cost burdened? Then feel free to either speak right up or to use the um, hand, chat, hand raise um, uh, sign on your screens and we'll watch that on the sides as well and call on names. And if you don't know how to use the hand raise chat, if you click at the bottom of your screen where it says participants, and that should pull up the list of everyone who's on the meeting and you can just raise your hand that way. Or if you have the little pictures on your screen, there should be three little dots. And if you click on those three little dots in the blue box, that will also let you raise your hand. All right, I see Mindy's hand up. Mindy, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for having this meeting. I just really, um, as a suburban person, and when we had our League of Women Voter Affordable Housing Study, we felt like, you know, we wanted to see if the suburbs were doing our share. And um, so it seems like it's a double-edged sword. Are we doing our share? But since we don't have as much poverty and people of color as St. Paul, then resources go to St. Paul. So we're kind of like, which is it? You know, should we do our share or should we, and then we would need resources and so forth. So I'm really glad to have a meeting focused on the suburbs because it's my opinion, 
we should be doing our share and um, not expecting St. Paul to do anything, but then we also need help from the county as well as St. Paul getting help. Um, and so my question though is um, what we have the hardest time probably everywhere um, in terms of political will and political courage is getting that 30% um, AMI population, which is clearly the most needed um, for people of color. And then my interest, which I was actually disappointed not to see any facts and figures about people with mental illness, because they're very low income people too. And that is regardless of race. If you are a person with a serious mental illness, you're apt to be homeless and so forth. Um, but what can the counties do? And some counties we learned in our study actually provide affordable housing, you know, get involved in, you know, helping maybe with partnerships to actually field some. And I wonder if Ramsey County has ever had any of those discussions. I'm really pleased you're working with Cura. Um, we did two with our league study and we had three wonderful grad or students. I think they were grad students. Um, who were provided by Cura, who helped us do data on our five suburban cities. And we were, um, it really was an education for us. And certainly back then, the study was four or five years ago, or maybe three or four. The 30% AMI was the biggest, that was one of our top recommendations too. So is Ramsey County doing anything or entertaining anything? And I would encourage anything to be done to help have a hand in having more um, affordable housing for the lowest sector. Martha or commissioners, do you want to respond to that particular question? I'd, I'd be happy to take a, a first stab and then others are welcome to add on. Um, yes, um, Mindy, thank you for that great question. and. Um, first, just in terms of sort of the capacity of um, the county, we have really not had a, a, a very robust community and economic development function, really a small mm -hmm. skeleton staff. Um, Carrie Collins was hired as the director of the community and economic development department. Um, just almost two years ago, we hadn't had a director for 14 years. And so um, there was really limited ability to be able to um, implement programs. And so the economic competitiveness and inclusion plan that is really the basis for a lot of the data that you saw is um, really attempting to take the pulse of the county, understand where we are, and to, um, through community engagement, to be able to help craft strategies to um, be able to equip the county to be able to better respond. Um, on the production side of affordable housing in a way that we just haven't been able to historically. And this is Commissioner Reinhardt. And uh, thank you, Mindy, for the question. And I think Martha has done a pretty good job of teeing this up for us. So um, in the past, we haven't. I mean, we have the housing, we have the HRA, and Commissioner Modest Castillo can speak to um, that because she is the chair of HRA. Um, but we have not had um, a levy that's associated with it. Um, we haven't in the past, well, until Carrie came on and we've been, uh, you know, going gung-ho since then, um, is about um, trying to figure out, okay, how, what role can we play and how can we do it? We've got, you know, the environmental response fund, we've got different tools, but we haven't put them all together the way they need to be put together. And that's part of what we're trying to do here. So, um, Yes, uh, we are um, going in that direction. And I think that Martha and Carrie and the team there um, working with the community, and that's something that's incredibly important, which is one of the reasons we're doing this this evening even. So um, we're making progress, but I expect that within the next two years, we'll make a lot more progress. But I would ask uh, Commissioner Modest Castillo if she could um, talk a little bit about this from the HRA perspective. Thank you, Victoria. Um, it's, so Victoria is my um, vice chair and I chair the HRA, but it really is a team effort. And, and luckily all the commissioners are really passionate about this housing stability. And one of the things and part of the, the impetus to do this big study is we didn't want to do what was already being 
done. We wanted to make sure that with our limited number of dollars and resources that the county has, that we are filling the gap uh, of what's missing, right? There's a lot of nonprofits that are doing fantastic work on affordable housing, but many of them are focused at you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% AMI. And we, we know very uh, quickly in this assessment, but that it's really the lower end of the spectrum of the, that have the most need. And so we feel like that's the area where we as government, as the county, need to step in to help. And so um, this study is really cementing exactly where uh, we are needed and will help us build on our strategy and work plan. Um, but we're not, we're not sitting idle and we're moving alongside this study. So you, um, you probably know we invested last year in um, uh, an investment for preservation of natural occurring affordable housing to leverage our funds into the greater Minnesota Housing Fund. We also have just recently released our budget where there's a proposal that should be passed later this year, investing uh, capital dollars into affordable housing at $8.9 million. So we're doing this work right at the same time that we're doing this study because we're really committed to doing this work and making sure that we have a housing affordability in all of our neighborhoods, that's not the same all, but in our suburban neighborhoods as well. Because quite frankly, there are many jobs in the suburbs, and we have a transit gap, but if we can have housing near the job that's affordable, we have solved many problems. So it's really important. So I love, Mindy, that you opened with, are we doing our part um, in the suburbs? And we need you to do your part because there's also jobs there, and we know that jobs and housing stability Thank you so much, commissioners, and thank you, Mindy, um, for that question. It's an excellent question. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. This is Barbara Russo. I'm uh, currently serving on the Shoreview Planning Commission. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we are struggling a bit with this because Shoreview is more or less completely built out. And so the opportunities for doing any um, major project uh, as a whole thing are limited. Uh, we're getting some infill. Uh, there is some naturally occurring affordable housing in the form of older single family home stock. Um, there's a manufactured home park and we have some older um, apartment complexes. But because of the land prices in the area, it's extremely difficult for developers to come in and decide to build more modest homes. A typical new home construction is in the 600 to $700,000 range. Um, we do get some townhome development, so those are a bit more affordable. And unless there's some sort of um, support being offered to companies that are building new apartment buildings to replace the old ones, uh, we can't really, um, under our current um, statute, our, our current um, <clears throat> code, we can't force them to include affordable units in it. So we're really looking for what tools we can develop as a city, what tools we can tap into uh, in, within the county or from outside organizations that would help us. Um, at the same time, recognizing that some of the issue results from past decisions. Uh, currently, we have a a minimum um, lot size requirement that perhaps is standing in the way of, of newer, more affordable construction, uh, which is something we take, could take a look at. If it's not something that is going to change overnight. So really looking for what tools people have used successfully and uh, what kinds of things we could tap into. Thanks, Barbara, for that question. I'll maybe take a first cut at that and, and welcome um, input from others too. Uh, next week, we are doing some community build sessions, we're calling them, as part of this plan. And our focus is really to, to, to um, drill down into thinking about what some of those solutions might be. We've started to give some early thought about those as part of this project. 
but really want to co-design those with um, our communities, our suburban partners, and with the City of St. Paul partners as well. So uh, again, I would invite you, if, if you're up for more, uh, we can let you know about that or, or how to engage along the way. But we have been thinking about a lot of um, different potential tools. Uh, some of them can be really, how do we tailor those, again, to where there's the most need for both homeowners and for renters, for homeowners to both be able to stay in their home. We know that there are a number of low-income homeowners and senior homeowners who may have maintenance needs may have need to you know make some improvements to their homes weatherization improvements and it, it's hard if you don't have the capital around to do that and so there there can be a lot of incentive then to either let the home deteriorate or you sell the home and then you might be moving into rental housing that might not be as it's easy to make that work with your limited um or fixed income that you might be on so we're thinking about that We've been looking at, um, are there opportunities for the, the county to um, provide some financing support? Uh, again, a lot of the existing financing tools for affordable housing that we have in this country, um, the low income housing tax credit is the biggest one. And that's really to work with private developers to be providing affordable housing. And that's, that's mostly geared for housing at 80% AMI. So we know it's gonna take some additional resources by the state, by the county, by municipalities um, to support that. There's some tools like, um, it's called the right of first refusal in some parts of the country, which would allow the county or localities, um, if we know that a private uh, apartment owner is gonna be selling that property, there can be the, the first right for an affordable housing developer or others to be able to come in and to purchase that home. So I think there are lots of different tools and we haven't landed on anything yet, but we're really looking at, at what those are and what's feasible for the county, what's really meeting the, the greatest needs of the county and how the county can really leverage because it's never gonna have all the resources needed to do all, all that needs to be done. So how can the county really be a smart and a strategic partner to leverage other private resources or state resources or federal resources? Are there others who would wanna share on that particular question? Um, any responses before? I know we've got Commissioner um, Pretham's hand up. I don't know if it's in response to that one or a different question, Commissioner. It's a different one, so uh, we'll let others respond. I guess I was just uh, commenting in the chat, but wanted to share, um, you know, when we talk about the requirements around large lot sizes, or even in some communities, there's a requirement for a minimum of two car garages. Um, I, I would challenge the local municipalities to think about those requirements as, you know, what was the intent versus what was the outcome, they're really a version of the modern day red line, right? Because we are, we're requiring so much land, so much cost that we're keeping people out by design. And so um, as the county, we don't have it, you know, we don't do zoning and jurisdiction, that's our, our cities and uh, local municipalities. But what I would encourage as part of the toolbox that, you, you know, um, you challenge your local leaders or at if you're a city leader to think about how do you about those zoning requirements um, so that we can get bigger density because there are some of our suburban neighbors have large lot sizes where you could essentially you know make them smaller lot size requirements put two homes or even do an accessory dwelling so that we can add to especially as we have people aging in place and they want to stay in their community but they don't need a five or three bedroom house right and so to think about how we Excellent feedback. Okay, Commissioner Fretham. I just didn't want to lose um, Andrea's comment uh, regarding uh, solutions for affordable housing beyond rentals. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge that that is absolutely something that we've raised at the county. Um, Martha's probably sick of me like asking her about community land trusts and why why can't we do more with community land trusts? <laughs> so I, I just really wanted to acknowledge that she's absolutely right there. There is more than just creating affordable rental rentals, paths to home ownership and building community wealth is critical in, in, in any sort of plan for economic inclusion, especially if you think back to that history of um, you know, racial inclusion 
inclusion and wealth building in communities and how can we think about reconciliation and wealth building and how, what are those pathways to home ownership and with those other challenges in building homes that there, there are some solutions out there. Um, so that, that is something as we build out this community and economic development team and strategy, um, it, that, that is something that we continue to look at uh, pathways to, to how we can create ways for people to get into homes and build that wealth and what that might look like. So I, I want to thank Andrea for raising that and make sure that that comment didn't get lost and I'll let others um, comment on that as well. Absolutely. Andrea, would you like to add any to that? Could I jump in again for a second? Absolutely. So it's Barb Russo again. Um, on the question of the lot sizes, um, we did have the discussion when we were uh, working on our long range plan uh, for Met Council. And so as part of that plan raised the possibility of creating a new zoning um, area that would allow much smaller lot sizes um, and that that might be ideal if, uh, for instance, our area with the manufactured home park becomes redeveloped at some point. Um, it's not something that we can easily work into the um, teardowns and infill in existing neighborhoods, uh, but it's a possibility on the horizon and I think that really needs looking at. Uh, we haven't worked it into the code yet though. Awesome. Thank you. Any other comments on either one of those points? Um, John Slade. Yes, thank you. Um, first off, I wanted to give you guys a huge amount of thanks for going over the racial equity background and, and going through the history of why it is the suburbs are so white and and that it was, you know, a lot of intentional government policy that led to that. Um, there's a kind of an, another hidden narrative, though, um, which has to do with the depth of investment by government in affordable housing. Um, and we have, uh, you know, famously, um, the, uh, the creation of the Rolls Royce driving welfare queen in the late 70s and the 80s. Um, and the massive pullback from a federal level. Um, and then, of course, at the state level, depending on who was in, in office, uh, either some real austerity politics or not. Um, <clears throat> and so when we look at the depth of what's going on, we have to say it has been uh, years and years and years of, of disinvestment in the poorest. Um, and uh, with that went other, you know, policies on taxes. Uh, I think that the the, any level of government has uh, can take a look at the at the market and say it's not working for the bottom half, the bottom third, um, and say there's two ways you can do it. You can either subsidize the market, and in which case finding more money. Um, and in the case of the county, I know that you've been looking at a tax levy. That would be a way to find more money for housing. Um, and the other way is to also look at uh, trying to uh, keep the market from burning out of control at the top end. Um, and so I'm wondering if the county has thought anything about any rent stabilization um, proposals. Um, and also that that could be a, a case for suburban communities itself where getting money is is a big issue. You know, are there ways that you can you can cap the the top, the you know, the 1970s building that was, you know, a hundred and or a thousand 1200 for a two bedroom and now they want to go up to 2000 for a two bedroom because they've got a marble countertop and a new fridge. Martha or commissioners, do you want to respond to that um, question around rent stabilization or other tools that the county may be considering or may have considered? Um, I can try to answer first. I, I've only been with the county since the beginning of 2019. So I, that's my, my limitation in terms of, um, and I've really been involved in this plan. So I can say in terms of this plan, we are trying to understand what are a range of tools that would be appropriate for the county to employ to both help provide rent support as well as um, 
you know, tools for additional production along the lines of what Maria was describing. Um, I don't think we've ruled anything in or out. We're just trying to, to um, understand the market, where the gaps are, what an appropriate role is for the county to play, where we can um, bring the most value to these solutions. And um, everything is kind of in the mix. And so that's the purpose of tonight's conversation as well as these build sessions coming up. Well, and this is uh, Victoria Reinhardt again. And honestly, I thank you for bringing it up, John. Um, I don't know if we legally have that tool. It's not been brought to my attention in the past anyhow. And I would think that it would have been had it been something we could do. But now we can look into it. Excellent. Checking to see if we have more hands. Oh yes, Gary. Yes, I, I don't know where this question fits uh, in the discussion, but <clears throat> I'm wondering if any of our suburbs in Ramsey County work with developers who are, who are building uh, housing, uh, doing housing projects to give them an incentive to put in affordability in their projects alongside the more market value, high, higher priced housing, whether it's rental or, or ownership uh, focused um, by by not relaxing exactly, but giving the incentives for greater density in some portions of the project, you know, smaller lots, uh, uh, not quite the high level of uh, quality inside. Instead of marble countertops, you might have a uh, different kind of material, that kind of stuff. Is that going on in our county and some of the suburbs or, or it, it didn't Maplewood quite a few years ago now. I worked on that uh, project myself and I know we, we didn't get everything we wanted, but we got, we got something <laughs> and it was worthwhile. And I don't know uh, if that's still going on or not. Anybody know? Okay, so yes, uh, it is going on. We we try to we try to incentive any developers that we're working with uh, to do affordable housing to make sure they have units. If it's rental, that they have units that they're developing in that time for housing affordability, because we we know that in um, fixed income mixed use uh, properties, it works really well. Um, and so the most of that work, though, admittedly comes from the cities themselves, where they have their individual HRAs. So part of this, part of this whole conversation is helping us build out, you know, our strategic plan and housing. Right now, Ramsey County has an HRA, but we only have pass-through dollars. So we use our CDBG funds in the suburbs, and then we also have some environmental rehab. But we and so we invest in those areas, but it's a very small pool of money. So we are looking at as we build this out, assessing the need, assessing the interest and support. You know, do we get to a point that at some point we raise a levy in order to fund housing specifically? And we have not done that historically, but that you know, where this whole plan is building that case for a need for potentially a levy specifically for housing because we know the benefit that. So as part of that, those same things that you raised are exactly what we're looking for. And this is Victoria. And um, yes, I know which, uh, I think I know which one you're talking about um, in Maplewood. And the funds that we used for that were the pass-through funds. So we have continued to do everything that we can with the CDBG funds, the home funds, I mean, the, the federal funds that are coming in. We have uh, for developers, and it's not specifically for affordable housing, but if there's something going on and there's an environmental issue that we put environmental response funds in, we've got the 4R program for renovating of properties. So there's different things that are going on, but primarily it's been passed through and that's continued. But quite frankly, um, we don't have enough. And that's why we really need to look at um, what, what can we do to um, raise some funds uh, locally um, that are for affordable housing or for housing, but also for economic development because it's tied together as was pretty clear in the presentation. So we are looking to, and again, um, as Commissioner Miles Castillo said, part of the 
pieces of the puzzle are what we are going through right now with this. We need to make sure we can bring it all together so that we're, we're doing things in a very efficient manner. Are there any cities that would respond to that? Are there any city solutions that are similar or comparable to um, what our commissioners have shared that are trying incentives like that or partnerships with developers to solve for that challenge? Of anyone that's on the phone or on the call? We don't really have the funds. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, for example, we just at our planning commission meeting on Tuesday, uh, we're hearing a plan, uh, there's a large apartment complex, multi, many, multi, many, many buildings, and they're, uh, getting pretty long in the tooth. They've been very well maintained. Um, they're not down on the bottom rings of affordability, but they, they're reaching their age limit. And so the owner is planning to replace one of the buildings with a newer building. The rents will be higher there. So we're losing 40 units all at once. And we're not going to be replacing those with this project. And we don't have any kind of incentive funds that we could provide that would, would enable those to be replaced. And of course, it doesn't make economic sense for the owner to build a new building and charge the same rent as, I can't remember exactly how old they are, but they're 40 years old or so, at least. I appreciate that, Barb. If I could add something here also, because I do know that even though, um, you know, an economic incentive um, is probably not uh, available for the cities and the township, but, um, I do know that our cities are working very closely with developers um, and with uh, Ramsey County to try to figure out what can be done. I mean, that's where the pass-through funds from the federal government come in um, to make sure that we're trying to um, get as much done as we can with the current tools that we have. So, I, but I think it's pretty clear we need to develop more tools. But I know that the cities in my district, Maplewood, White Bear Lake, North St. Paul, and I have one precinct in St. Paul as well, um, are all working with the developers and zoning and, and trying to figure out the best ways to move forward. But I think one of the reasons for this also is that um, we can share ideas and tools and, and when you get a, more, a, bit, a better grasp of the issues that led us to this point, it also helps us learn from history so that we can try to correct some things. So, I just I, I do want to make sure that that the, the cities and the township get the credit that is due as far as trying to do things. But if you don't have the economic incentive, it makes it more difficult. That's for sure. May, I jump in here, Jason Etten from the Roseville City Council. I know Graham Allen from New Brighton has got his hand up there too. But uh, I appreciate that that note, Commissioner Reinhardt. You, you don't represent us, but I think that's very true. Um, for our area, you know, we've we've used tax increment financing fairly heavily in the last few years as a tool that the cities do use in partnership with the other pass-through pieces that the county is using, um, as well as partnerships. Uh, maybe eight years ago, Aon purchased several decrepit buildings near Target uh, on 36 and Snelling, and received tax increment financing from us as well as other dollars. We renovated them all kept the rents low and built a, they were all single family, a uh, single bedroom, and then built a, a housing unit for families at the same time. Uh, we're trying to partner with them in Southeast Roseville for the same thing, thinking about how we're preserving uh, housing. Um, and then we're looking at doing an inclusive housing ordinance study, kind of see what would that be? And that's where you're embedding uh, affordability into some units as something else is built. And what is it gonna cost? And that may be a time for the county to say, okay, you looked at this, where can we step into that? Um, the county having dollars would be very helpful. Um, we, as our economic development authority, have some dollars for helping renovations of, of high density, as well as helping with loans for single family, but there, you never feel like you have enough, especially you redo a 
multi-unit building and your money disappears instantly. So, so how we, how we can get more and part of that's through these partnerships with other organizations, but uh, those are some of the tools that we are using right now or looking forward to. And we're um, right now being built or it will be finished in the next year and a half or so we have over 550 units of senior as well as family affordable units. Um, and so I think that's been effective in, in moving that forward fairly well, but I would agree that, under 50% or certainly a 30% is just not happening right now. It's very rare. Thanks, Jason. That's a great example of the types of partnerships we're looking for in that second question that help us figure out how we can leverage county resources alongside city resources and those private dollars, um, as well as other types of resources that can come from um, both cities, counties, and community-based organizations. Um, Graham, I think, had his hand up as well. Yeah, uh, uh, Jason answered kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of typical ways that cities, uh, well, first, I should, my name is Graham Allen. I'm a New Brighton City Council member. Um, I think J Jason kind of answered the kind of, you know, a lot of the classic ways that, that uh, cities are able with limited re re, uh, resources to be able to, you know, uh, either preserve or create, uh, generate new housing. I know in New Brighton in the last two years, we've taken on a project uh, working with a developer using TIF financing um, uh, at the 60% 60, uh, 60 area. Uh, median income uh, tax uh, break for the developer uh, from uh, the state and federal government. Um, you know, that's that's it. We have about two, about two and a half million dollars, let's say, in terms of our development authority to be able to kind of, you know, uh, invest in projects, buy land, you know, kind of some of the initial uh, infrastructure that you'd want to do before you actually get the check from the developer, so to speak. Um, but yeah, uh, with, you know, a couple million dollars, um, you know, uh, we're incredible, you know, we're kind of project by project based too. Um, you know, it took us about a year and a half, let's say, from the time that we started work on a project, had the agreement with the, the developer, and then uh, would get the, the, the lump sum check uh, of uh, our tax portion and reimbursement for kind of the infrastructure. You know, it takes a year and a half. So we can only do, uh, you know, a, a year and a half's worth of projects at a time um, with the limited resources that we have. Um, just a couple other comments. Uh, the biggest issue that I, I imagine will we'll, we'll face New Brighton and probably some of the surrounding communities is we're going to lose most of our natural affordable, affordable housing. I think everyone had kind of talked about the, the you know, the, the market has now become uh, interesting to national developers. And so, you know, as we've seen in Richfield a couple of years ago, um, uh, uh, Bloomington, uh, Minneapolis, you know, outside groups coming in, purchasing uh, naturally affordable housing and, and, and making it nice and then charging a lot more. Uh, that is, I think, the next front uh, that, that we're going to face in, in the suburbs because uh, it's far cheaper to, if, you're, if, if, you're, if, if uh, housing is an investment for you, uh, to come in, buy something cheaply, charge more uh, in the flip side than, than, than paying for expensive land, um, potentially having to de uh, demolish something, and then building new. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of what I see. I think you know, just from an advocate, if, if we're skipping to two, because I only want to talk once, um, you know, uh, we definitely, as a, as a, as everyone interested in housing, need to advocate at the state level that there are more grants for developers to 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 access the 30% area median income, um, uh, you know, grant to make it financially feasible. Um, you know, ba you know, the sad the sad reality is like from my experience uh, with New Brighton was no development developer uh, wanted uh, to automatically go to 30% because they would make less. Um, and the, and the, tax, uh, the number of the tax credits available for that are so few that most don't even try. Um, the second point I think that it was critical for me to learn in my city uh, in the last two years is that we just don't have a lot of, we don't have experts in our staff that understand kind of housing policy and housing trends outside of kind of the, the zoning requirements and things like that, just, just strict policy, um, you know. And I think the more that you can provide opportunities for staff as well as elected officials to learn more about uh, the trends, uh, policies that are working in other places, to counteract some of the, the, the challenges we have, I think that, that would uh, be incredibly beneficial. Just to give you an example, I, I am labeled by my city manager as the housing expert uh, in our city. And, and I just do this as a pastime because I'm passionate about this issue. Um, but, you know, we, we don't have an expert and, 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 and you folks are, uh, especially at the county, are real experts. Um, and, and I also want to thank for, for months ago, pre-COVID, uh, for Ramsey County coming in and talking about uh, affordable housing and housing policy and the kind of new direction they were taking. Uh, 
so I just want to say that, yes, they've reached out and we appreciate that. Um, but obviously more work to be done. Thank you. Sorry for that long diatribe. Very valuable. No apologies it's, needed. I tag in on the end of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank, thanks for bringing the, uh, all those pieces up, uh, Graham. Um, what, one of the things I'd written down here is uh, one of the ways the county can do that, and I think that's exactly what Graham was talking about, bringing together the, the economic development staff from the different cities and having the best practices thing. And some of them go to this or some of them go to that, but so you know we're going to sit down here. What are the tools you're using, making sure people are talking, but then what are the tools you would need to get X housing? What, what, would you, what would you need cities? So as you look at, we might do 11, we might add powers to the county. What are, what are you gonna go for? What's, you know, so talking to the cities who have some of that control. Um, the other piece looking at that $9 million or whatever you, you've put in your budget for 2021 and talking about land trusts and talking about infill. So you've got two lots sitting next to each other that weren't developed. Can that be zoned for in Roseville and our LDR too? Is it still under a low density? Uh, you could put townhomes in there and then have the land as the land trust, the townhomes would be much cheaper and more affordable for folks. And you're embedding that within the broader community rather than um, rather than stuck on the sides or in a high density building. So that would be another great partnership um, to consider. So we look at our making sure our zoning would fit. You provide some of that capital for the land. And we work to find developers who would build for example, townhomes. I think townhomes are a thing that can be more affordable, but yet are still a home. They can build the equity that is so important. Awesome. We've got Tracy and then Commissioner McGuire. Um, speak, I'm speaking from a staff perspective, but more just a concerned resident about affordable housing. So don't want to pretend that I represent elected officials. Um, one thing that I've seen, I've now worked in the housing for a couple of years now. One thing that I've seen that really um, has been a challenge as far as creating affordable housing is the fact that there, there are very limited time frames as far as assembling financing for these projects. And when you're, you are trying to, in a, in a almost fully built out um, county like Ramsey County or community like the one I live in, um, land assemblages in and of themselves is a challenge, but aligning those assemblages um, with the financing cycle as far as when you apply for low housing income tax credits um, or you apply for CDBG funds is really challenging and the stars really have to align to make that all happen and it's a huge roadblock. So um, whether I would say if there was no, more nimble financing available at the st state level would be the biggest help but um, having those more nimble financing available at the county level would be a big help as well. Thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? I'm so sorry. I'm having technical difficulties here. And so I've been uh, listening to the conversation, but I'm not always able to come in. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, great. Um, so just wanted to say, and I know we're getting toward the end of this, that I've so appreciated all of this conversation. And I have really um, want to give kudos to all of our partners at our cities. You know, we have just amazing, you know, New Brighton is doing great work in Graham. I know you're, you say you're not the expert and, but you've been pushing so hard on really great issues and Jason and in and, and Roseville and I know Mindy Greiling and the League of Women Voters and Craig Clossing. I don't, I don't remember, know if he's had a chance to speak, but he's had a great housing uh, group going. And so we've just had great partners within our cities and we've got Carrie Collins that came from Roseville now directing our in our, our housing and and uh, redevelopment uh, department so we're with Martha and everything so we are really poised now with all of this great work being done to get the work done in, in my district and I know with um, Nicole and uh, Commissioner Fretham and Commissioner Reinhardt and Commissioner Mattis Castillo we are and all of all of us on the county board we are very excited about the work that we need to do together here. We really need to keep working on this. So I just wanted to make sure we gave shout outs. And I do want to give a shout out from um, Representative Alice Houseman, who couldn't be on the call tonight. She wanted to be here, but we know she's a huge advocate for housing as the chair of housing committee. And I just wanted to give you her uh, regards, but she is really willing to work with us on everything we need from the state level. So thanks. I just wanted to, to uh, recognize all the work that's being done and to, to just say that we have lots of work to do together. So thank you 
all of you for being here. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We are at about two minutes, and so I am going to be sure that if there are any additional um, comments that our commissioners uh, want to offer, um, Commissioner Reinhardt, Commissioner Fretham, um, and others, if there are any, and Commissioner Amadis Casillo, if there are any additional comments that you all want to offer um, as our host, um, please um, feel free to do so now um, before we give our final um, wrap up and other ways that our guests can stay involved in this work as our partners. Well, this is Commissioner Reinhardt, and I just want to say thank you. This has been an amazing uh, town hall, and I want to make sure we keep this group together because we need to we need to tackle all of this together. And it's very clear that we've got an enthusiastic group on this call. So thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Madison, I just want to check and see if you wanted to say anything. I'm just super jazzed as an HR chair and, you know, housing has been my passion and my life's work for the last, you know, uh, couple decades. And so this is really exciting to have this group and folks um, who are really engaged and have uh, great ideas. And, you know, I, I get to work with many of you in other categories. And so it's really great to work on housing. And this is, this is really hopeful and inspiring to hear that our suburban partners are really wanting to step up and as Mindy said, do their part. And so um, I'm just really excited about this and love your feedback and hope that we keep this conversation and relationship growing. Well, I, I am so grateful that um, Patricia's Madis Castillo and Reinhardt and McGuire were able to join us and uh, for Martha and Maria and Tawana for all of your efforts to put this incredible presentation together to bring us together and educate and set a baseline and for everyone who, who came tonight to be a part of this and all of your efforts. I know many of you have been working in this sphere for a long time. This is such critical work and uh, I, I think this is really the time to be, to be moving forward on this, that we have some momentum here and I'm really excited about what the county is doing with our economic inclusion plan and with affordable housing being such a key component of that moving forward. So um, this, uh, someone did ask whether the presentation, uh, the, both the recording of this session and the, the PowerPoint would be available and the answer is yes. So we'll be sharing that um, and um, getting that out to people. So please feel, sh feel free to share with others who might be interested, um, our, our city council people share with, share with your peers. Um, we think this is important information that needs to be shared um, far and wide. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm so glad you were able to make it tonight. And um, yes, thank you for your partnership. And please uh, join, uh, join the partners and the, the team working to develop the plan and continue sharing your feedback. I'm glad we were able to share those links tonight as well to continue to be a part of that full Ramsey County plan. I'm glad we got to take some time tonight to, to focus a little bit about what that means here in the suburbs uh, for all of us and Mindy for, for calling out that, you know, that kind of place that we sit in that feels a little bit different sometimes and I'm glad we had that time. So yes, it'll be on the Ramsey County YouTube channel ASAP and should be found at the same link for night session on Ramsey.us. So thank you so much, everyone. I, this, this was wonderful. I'm, I'm glad we were able to do this and I really appreciate everyone's time and participation. Thank you so much, Commissioner. A big thank you to all of you, um, especially to um, our commissioners for hosting this and organizing it um, and inviting us to um, co-partner um, and facilitating it. All of the feedback that you've given us tonight is going to be extremely helpful in building out this plan. And we look forward to partnering with you again, not only to develop the plan, but more importantly for the implementation. Um, and we will be back in not only sharing um, the tools from tonight, but also in sharing the results from this and moving forward with you all very soon. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone.